the Tech Help Show. I am your host, Craig Chamberlain, and we are in another edition of the PCM Tech Talk Live segment, which I've dedicated to my subscribers. Now, you don't have to be a subscriber on YouTube to follow this particular segment, but Tech Talk Live is basically a way for me to interact with you guys who I've grown to love so much over my three years doing YouTube Tech Help videos. And remember, the PCM Tech Help Show is free, will always be free, and the whole philosophy behind it is that if I help you guys out, hopefully I'll grow faster. <laughs> But uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to swing by the website, that's at PCMTechHelp.com. If you want to swing by the YouTube channel and subscribe, you can do PCMTechHelp.com slash YouTube. And I just launched the new community, something I want to kind of open up with this morning. The community page is going to be done through Google+. And if you go to PCMTechHelp.com slash community, it will bring you directly to the Google Plus community page. I'm very, very excited about using Google Plus for my community setup. The great thing about Google Plus is it has the Hangouts feature so that my community members can hang out with each other. Uh, I can also set up Hangouts to hang out with my community, and we can interact with our video, and we can share our desktops, we can share our Google Docs, and all kinds of really cool things right within the community page. Very, very cool community design that's done by Google. I have to applaud them on Google Plus so far. I think they've done a fantastic job as far as a social network is concerned. Um, another reason I decided to use Google Plus, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, if you have a Google account, like a Gmail account, or if you have a YouTube account, all of those same exact email addresses can be used to actually sign up for a Google Plus account then they can actually connect with your other networks. This is going to be something that Google works on heavily over the next year. They've actually been working on it, whether you realize it or not, for the past year. And their big motive behind this is to actually get people um, on their particular network. Um, what they're going to do is meld YouTube, Google+, and all of their apps into a single service. And they haven't officially announced this, but... It, the more I actually watch what they're doing, the more it's becoming painstakingly obvious. Uh, they just recently allowed you to connect your Google Plus account to your YouTube account, and it actually displays your Google Plus profile picture now when you make comments, and you can actually display your official Google Plus name. So these features aren't accidental. These are all kind of a migration that Google's uh, performing, and it's actually kind of a really cool idea, because I hope that one day my community is also, my YouTube community is also my Google Plus community. So joining the community, you'll get a number of benefits. Obviously, that's where I'm going to hang out the most and interact with people the most. Um, I'll be able to share links and videos. Um, and I got a real big kick out of a video that was just posted by... Uh, I'll, I'll probably comment a lot about it in my videos, in my open live series. So if you really want to talk about something that I'm going to share with the people in the videos, uh, post it in the community page. But uh, Jack Barth posted a video on here called Windows 8, The Animated Evolution. And uh, it's about 23 minutes long, but it's a, a, it's a pretty hilarious commentary on the Windows 8 environment. And it's, it's very competent as well. Uh, it's probably overly critical of Windows 8. So if you like Windows 8, I probably wouldn't recommend watching it. But it was pretty humorous to me. Uh, I got a good laugh out of it. And you can find that at the community page as well. Remember, that's pcmtechhelp.com slash community. I'm going to be pushing it heavily because I get a lot of questions. I kind of want it all in one place. So we'll get there. We'll get there, definitely. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, start off today's segment with uh, something we left off on yesterday, and that was picking an operating system. A gentleman had asked me a question at the end of the segment, and I couldn't elaborate on it heavily. So I ended up having to kind of cut it short and now I can kind of help him out, maybe. I had to email him because he had pointed it out. Uh, he was in a situation where he's used to Windows 7, and he was adopting a system that was a Windows... Uh, he was trying to decide what operating system he wanted between Ubuntu... Uh, no, no, he said Linux was too complicated, and uh, his Windows 7 operating system he was used to, and Windows 8, too was, Windows 8 was a nightmare. And so he decided to ask me what I thought his best options were. And unfortunately, if you're in a situation where you're trying to pick an operating system and you're already used to 7, you're not really going to get an upgrade from that point. 
now that you actually are kind of dedicated and, and used to 7, which is what I think the most efficient operating system that Microsoft has created, you're going to run into a situation where anything you segue from there is going to be quite a learning curve. And really, I think that there's a lot of heavy things that would have to be considered for you to actually migrate to, like, Mac or to uh, Ubuntu, uh, which is actually a very user-friendly Linux environment. Or, I mean, other than that, there's not a whole lot of options. Uh, you got the Chromebook option. So when you're choosing an operating system, it comes down to basically three things. You know, what are you going to use it for? What are you used to? And how much are you willing to pay? Okay. What are you going to use it for? If you're going to use it exclusively just for web-based applications, I strongly recommend people look into the Chromium operating system, which is Google's operating system. They released Chromium as part of their Chromebooks, and it's essentially Google Chrome. If you're used to Google Chrome, you know how to use the Chromium operating system. The boot time on these Chromebooks is about 10 seconds, and they do anything web you can imagine. But they also integrate with things like Google Docs, and all of their apps, basically. Google Mail, Google Docs, YouTube, um, Google Plus, Facebook, anything that's internet-based. And you also have at your fingertips a complete segment or a complete catalog of applications that can help you get things done. So that's a great thing to consider if you do heavily internet-based applications. And a Chromebook runs about $250. So it's definitely worth the investment if that's all you do. They're also lightweight. Good deal. Uh, Ubuntu is a great option now uh, as a Linux distribution. I usually push it pretty heavily because it's free and it does have a nice clean interface and an app store now. So you can actually go straight to Ubuntu's website, Google Ubuntu, and uh, you can actually download the ISO image. And if you're running Windows 7, you can double click on the image and burn it straight to a DVD or a CD. And then you can actually put that CD in your drive when you boot. And then at that point, actually, uh, Excuse me for one second. I actually have to pause this. <laughs> um, hopefully you guys can hear me. I was experiencing some technical difficulties on that one. Um, my child needed me. Uh, apparently she was having trouble going to sleep because she heard me. <laughs> Tom Prokes pretty much called it. Um, he pretty much called it. Uh, I had to I had to help the baby relax a little bit. She heard me in the other room and she started freaking out. So anyways, uh, where were we? I said... Um, what you're going to use it for, for an operating system. And then, of course, you've got to go into the price. Price is, of course, essential. I stopped on Ubuntu, didn't I? Okay. Ubuntu is a great operating system. 
obviously, because it's available for free, you go straight to their website, you can download it, double click on it, burn it to a CD, and you can actually just boot your computer right off it and install it right away. Now remember, this will wipe your old operating system, but, you know, free, you know, it's worth a shot. And if you know anything about virtualization, you can use VirtualBox, which is by Oracle. That's at my website. If you go to PCMTechHelp.com, I have like 80 free downloads, a bunch of tools I've used. It's called Oracle's VirtualBox that will let you actually install that environment right on your operating system, like Windows 7 or Windows 8, and play around with it before you do that. Um, but anyways, let's go ahead and we'll hold off on that one because um, I can't really elaborate on it further. I got too distracted. I got too distracted on that one. Uh, it was price, usability, what you're used to, and what was the last one? Couldn't remember. Can't remember. I'll leave it up to you guys. We'll go ahead and move on. Let's move into your questions. We're 10 minutes into the hour, and that's what I usually like to do. I'll do a 10-minute opening, and got a little interrupted, so thank you for your patience, and we will actually go ahead and go to the questions now. BigNate84 says, greeting. Greetings. I have your live, live stream up on my flat screen. We'll see how well, long that lasts. The baby is fussing, and I think I'm on duty next. Well, I can relate to that, Big Nate 84. <laughs> I just uh, I just got called up, beckoned out of the room by mine, so uh, I get it. <laughs> ADMRS says, hello again. Welcome back, ADMRS. Hope you've joined the community. Uh, I think you have, haven't you? Um, make sure you do that. It's Google+. Plus. Uh, Reb1990X, welcome back. I uh, appreciate you guys coming back. Tom Proak says, Craig, have you ever tried Clementine 1.1 for a music player? I first used it with Pin Guy 12.04 LTS. I found it for Windows and is magnificent. People should know of alternatives to WMP. Um, Windows Media Player is actually a half-decent media player. I, I have some issues with Windows Media Player, I think, that are obvious that most people probably have as well. Um, it's unstable, tends to be unstable, uh, kind of jumpy and uh, I'd say buggy a lot of the time, uh, but I kind of have the same experience with iTunes, so I can't really bash Windows Media Player. There's something about Media Player software in general that it almost seems like they're trying to do more than you actually want to do with it, and as a result, it always tends to be a lot clunkier, and it just doesn't do what the basic function of a Media Player was supposed to be, and that is play and organize your music. And I, I find it kind of frustrating that a lot of them have to have a lot of these a lot of these hoops you got to jump through just to get things moving on them. Uh, personally, it's not really a media player. I, I use a VLC. It is free. VLC media player. It's not a media organizer, though, for all of my audio when I'm playing it. Uh, that's a great tool. That's on my website as well under audio and video. Uh, I've never actually used Clementine 1.1. Let's give it a little looky here. And you were the one who recommended PinGuy 12.04, which is actually a Linux operating system. Um, 1.1. What was real big? It was Winamp. That was really popular. And, and Winamp was a cool software package as well. But this actually looks pretty promising. Clementine Music Player. Another really cool recommendation from Tom Prokes. Uh, you were here a couple days ago, and you had mentioned uh, Linux distribution. Now, this does look kind of like a really cool way to organize. It looks like you can do your podcasts on it. it looks like it supports Google Drive, LastFM, GrooveShark, Magnatune, iCast, digitally imported music, which is really kind of a cool thing. And uh, it's really, if if you're as frustrated with me, you're you're more than willing to actually try these alternatives to media players, what operating systems does it support? They do have a Windows distribution, as you said. Looks like it supports a lot of the Linux distributions. Fedora, Mac OS X, there's an option for there. And Debian, Ubuntu, lots of Ubuntu distributions. So that's worth checking out. Good good idea, Clem, um, Joe. Tom. <laughs> Tom, Joe, same thing, three-letter word, that's all the same stuff. Uh, looks like it does download your, your media art. On the left-hand side, it does allow you to actually organize your albums. Very promising. I think I will check this out. Thank you for the suggestion. I have not checked that out, and it looks like it's free. I love free. You guys are here. <laughs> you guys are here more often. You'll learn how much I love free alternatives to software. Then Retarded Horses, welcome back. They say, 
Way, I'm here at the start. Or yay, maybe? I'm here at the start. Way, maybe that's because you're a horse. Maybe. Adam Trailer says, welcome. Welcome. Digging the later time frame. I am too. Uh, Limb Retarded Horses is the one who had actually said that he's here at 2 a.m. Looks like Scandal made it. Uh, here's a question from Tom Prokes. I have an Intel iCore 3 processor, and I thought you said they were all quad-core. Mine is dual-core. Dual-thread shows up as a quad-core. I don't know. Actually, the Core i series only has one dual-core, and that is the Core i 3 series. The i5 and the i7 are all quad. So you do have an i3. The i3 processor is most definitely a dual-core processor. Fantastic processor, by the way. Uh, probably one of the best ones out in the market. So if you're going to go with a dual-core system, i3 is a really good way to go. Uh, if you want to jump up to quad, you will have to upgrade to the i5 or the i7. They all use the same socket. You get the LGA1155, I believe, on that one. So that one's a, that one's a pretty cool one. Next question, PCOMFUNFAN97. I have a good question I wanted to ask you. Did you make your own website or did someone else make it? Uh, I think I got this question a couple days ago. And the interesting thing about web design is now it's like a hybrid effort between uh, WordPress theme developers and coders. I personally did not design, like design design, the original theme to my website. That was actually done by a company called Press 75. Press 75 is managed by I think two or three guys and to be absolutely honest with you they make fantastic themes. Now they're called Press 75 because they actually make themes that cost $75. And so you actually purchase their professional theme for 75 bucks a one-time fee and then you can use it for whatever purposes you want to use it for. Now Press 75 in my case worked out great because they like to create media centric themes uh, photography, video, things like that, uh, music, those are really big for them. And so I was really looking for a theme that would kind of delve into my YouTube type platform because YouTube was where I started. So now I'm in a situation where I'm not only am I on YouTube, but I wanted to create a actual website that would support those elements. And the great thing about Press 75 is they have like drag and click or right click and paste YouTube embedding features. Awesome, awesome theme. Uh, as for the actual customizations of that theme, actually I did that myself. So I tweaked it, I modified a lot of the UI, I I placed the ads in my own locations and I went in and I actually modified the code. I am by no means an advanced PHP programmer, but I've worked with WordPress long enough to know how to get around the code to kind of manipulate it to make it do what I want to do. So I know just enough to be dangerous, essentially. But uh, no, I didn't design it myself. I, that's Press75. That's Press75.com. I definitely recommend checking them out if you're looking for a media-centric theme. Great guys over there and always support. I'm always a big fan of small business, people who are starting their own kind of venture, and uh, they're worth checking out if you're interested in buying a theme like that. Uh, I always go WordPress, man. You can just you can save so much money now creating your own professional website. I mean, I just bought a theme for a company last week for $30, and it had a full embedded shopping cart system, had a full embedded... Uh, SEO and, and WordPress optimization suite embedded into it. Uh, and it's just got galleries so you can manage all of your, your products. I mean, it's a drag and drop features. These are websites that traditionally would cost you thousands, if not tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to get designed. And out of the box with WordPress, with a really good, solid, paid for theme, you can get really, really advanced functionality. And very good documentation for them, too. So that's definitely something to consider. I'm, I'm a huge WordPress guy. Huge on WordPress. Jack says, hi everyone. Jack, I loved your video. I got a kick out of it. And that's at the community. For those of you who are just joining in, that's pcmtechhelp.com slash community. I'm going to push it heavily. Sorry, I don't want to consider spamming. It's completely free, but uh, that's where we all live. We all hang out there. I just started it today. I already got 25 people. Awesome. Thank you guys for joining. Uh, but Jack posted a video there about Windows 8. It's quite hilarious. Worth checking out. Tom Prokes, his turn to change the, ba change the baby. Kind of, yeah. Pico, fun fan. I think he went over a different vid. I would have Windows 9 this year. Would there be a Windows 9 this year? Uh, 
Rev1990X asks, would there be a Windows 9 this year? Hmm. Well, the turnover for software is traditionally about two years. It's like a two-year life cycle. Operating systems that successfully turn themselves over usually operate on a four-year or more cycle, and it's about on schedule for Windows 8, because uh, Windows 7 came out in 2007 or 2008, I believe. So it's actually on schedule for Windows 8 to be released. But the problem is, is people were so ready for 7 that they just started to adopt it in the business world, and it just felt like it was too soon with Windows 8. And I don't think they've succeeded on this four-year life cycle, now that I think about it. If you think back to Windows XP, you had Windows XP, then they released Vista, and a lot of people adopted Vista because they were kind of ready to get off XP. A lot of people did. And so then Vista kind of sucked, and then they released 7, and so well, I guess maybe it's just because the operating system sucked. Never mind. I was going to try to say that maybe the reason Windows 7 was so successful because people weren't ready for Vista, but I'm more inclined to say Vista was just a bad operating system, which is why people waited for 7. That's probably a more legitimate argument. Uh, but it runs on a four-year life cycle, usually for operating system or more. So you're looking at 2013, 14, 15, 16, probably 2016, 2017 before you see Windows 9, unless they see it as a huge tragedy and decide that they need to do something quickly. And even then, it'll probably be a two-year cycle. But they'll probably commit to it since it's already there. So... Philly Computer Spot said, I flew home to watch. Man, that must have been expensive. <laughs> Sarcasm. <laughs> if you like it that much, Philly, make sure you stop by the community page. Not that I'm plugging it shamelessly, but that's at pcmtechhelp.com slash community. <laughs> CJ Gagner asks, Hi, Craig. What is your favorite browser? My last name is pronounced Gagne. Oh, so CJ Gagne? Okay, CJ Gagne asks, what's my favorite browser? This is a good question, okay? I've worked with many, many a browser in my time, and I hate to give the same cop-out answer I give lots of people, and that is it depends on the user. Now, of course, Internet Explorer I don't like. Uh, I don't think it's efficient. I don't think it's user-friendly, and honestly, it's really buggy in a lot of websites and a lot of rendering. Uh, for internet speed, yeah, I'd have to go with I'd have to go with Chrome without extensions. If you're running Chrome and you don't have any extensions installed, it's extremely fast. Uh, but you can also, on the same level, go with Safari, Apple Safari, also incredibly fast. I'd say their rendering speeds to me are almost equivalent. So for the fastest browsing experience, I'd probably push people to Google Chrome or Apple Safari. Now, you can get Google Chrome and Apple Safari at my website at the Downloads page, um, but Apple Safari is basically available anywhere. If you just Google it, same with Google Chrome. Uh, Chrome has made astounding growth in their ad adaptation of their browser because it does offer extensions. Extensions are similar to plugins, on, on Firefox, but not the same. So that'll segue us into Mozilla Firefox. Now, the reason I love Firefox is because of the flexibility and custom, customizability. Very few browsers give you full customization capability where you can literally create the most efficient browsing experience just for your personality. And Firefox does that better than anybody else. And that's by Mozilla. So you have three basic options here that I usually recommend. You're either doing Chrome or Safari. If you want just pure speed, do Safari. If you want some speed with flexibility or really fast speed with flexibility, do Chrome. If you want uh, full customization and full flexibility but a little bit less performance, not much, uh, go with app, uh, Mozilla Firefox. But prepare to kind of get under the hood and really start digging into what it can do because it can do almost anything you can imagine. Really, it's a fascinating browser that they created with Mozilla. And the expandability with plugins on that are far more in-depth and available than on Chrome or any other browser right now. So my favorite is Chrome because I like a little bit of customization, but I also like the speed. So I just think I get much better, much better experience out of that for myself. So it really just kind of depends on your personality type. 
So excellent questions, uh, C.J. Gagne. Nobody's ever going to learn how to spell that, by the way. <laughs> so let's go ahead and go to the next question. Uh, wow, Linus says, wow, thank you for the time change. You're most welcome. I appreciate the time change as well. Sorry for the slight interruption we had in this video. Uh, but hey, I guess I'm not sorry. It was my kid. I can't really... I'm sorry I have a two-year-old. <laughs> uh, Jack Barth says, Craig, what do you think about the consumer electronics show? Hang on, it's companies, Google, Microsoft, Apple, forcing you into an ecosystem to use all of their features. I think their time is coming. Uh, I, well, I can't really say that. Um, I guess I would have to, have to ask you to elaborate on that because if you go into what do you think about consumer electric companies forcing you into an ecosystem to use all of their features, uh, is, it, is it monopolistic to make people use your feature? Because, I mean, okay, this is, this is hard for me to kind of clarify. Is it monopolistic if they're using your software to begin with to have them use whatever software you've designed to work in conjunction with your software? Is that considered monopolistic? Is that considered unethical? Personally, I think from a consumer standpoint and a business standpoint, the businessman in me says, okay, listen, if I can sell them on my product, then I should have the privilege or the right to kind of push them into continue to using my sub-products within that product. I don't think that is that unreasonable because the alternatives to my product are still out there. In other words, nobody's forcing people to use Chrome. Nobody's forcing people to use Chromium operating system. Nobody's forcing people to use an Android phone. Nobody's forcing people to use a, a Mac computer. So there are alternative platforms out there. Uh, I think that it does upset people when you force them to adopt a platform like that and it has a chance of pushing them away as a consumer. So I think from a sales point, it's probably not a good idea to force you to use their software in their ecosystem or their features in their ecosystem. But from a business standpoint, I don't think it's uh, immoral for them to do that. I think, I think it's logical for them to do that. Because in order for them to improve their product, they need people to use it. And what better chance to get your product in their face or your new product in their face than through something you actually sold them on to begin with. You know, you walk into the store and you're choosing between an Apple device, a Android device, or a Microsoft device. You you pretty much you should know that whatever device you choose, you are going to be limited to whatever they have allowed you to be limited to. Uh, and obviously, Google has been the most flexible in that out of all three. Uh, Apple is far more notorious, and uh, Microsoft are far more notorious. Apple more than anybody else for forcing people to adopt their system, but they have an argument for it. Their argument is that, hey, our system is stable, it's secure, and we can continue to keep it stable and secure if we don't allow other people to mess with it. So they lock out their kernel and lock out those features so that they can't be hacked. So they have a semi-legitimate, or I would actually argue a legitimate argument for that. But that's actually an excellent question. I mean, it's kind of a it's kind of a moral question on the same level as it is a business or consumer-based question. And, and I hope that kind of at least gives you an idea of where I stand on it because I'm kind of like a, I'm halfway between. I can see why they do it, but I also think from a sales perspective, it might not always be the best idea to force your products on somebody like that or force the features on somebody. So Jack Barth says... Favorite media players, VLC. Now, Jack, for that particular, I'd like to see if you could answer this for me. Is there actually a good way to organize your media on VLC? I mean, it's my favorite. VLC media player we've talked about earlier in this video. It is a great free media player. It'll play almost anything you can imagine. But I haven't come up with a good solution for organizing all of my audio and media within VLC. I mean, I think every system should have VLC just for playing video and audio types, but when it comes to actually organizing them, I think you might want to look for a different product. Okay, looks like we got a couple uh, removed comments from the author. Uh, Endless031 says, FUBAR and WinAmp is what I use. I have not used FUBAR. I've heard of it. WinAmp is very popular. It was around for a long time. 
Uh, Tom Walla looks like he uses Winamp as well. Uh, Winamp was very, very popular, and, and for, for good reason. A uh, great thing about Winamp is it's actually very cost... Uh, it's free, first of all, but it's also very efficient. It's not this big, massive application that bogs down your machine when you're trying to use it. And that, my friends, is what frustrates me about iTunes and Windows Media Player. You know, if I want to listen to music, I just want to open up an application, find my music, and play it. Although it is kind of cool how pretty it looks when I open up my iTunes and Windows Media Player. But what's the point in something looking pretty if I'm listening to music in a lot of ways? So I've gotten a lot better about that, though. Who? Uh, then my retarded horses asks, is it hard or easy to make an MMORPG with no knowledge, or is there any free software to do this? I don't know of any free software to make an MMO. MMORPGs go all the way back to text-based role-playing games called MUDs. If you want to get into MMO programming, I would suggest you start there. Look into MUD programming. It's M-U-D. Multi-user dungeon, I think, is what it was stood for. Let me see. Uh, you want to look into creating MUDs. Those were text-based game. Uh, MUD games. I don't even know if you can find them anymore. MUD. Uh, MUD combined elements of role-playing. Multi-user dungeon is what it was called. Uh, originally multi-user with later variants. Multi-user dimension and multi-user domain. It's a multiplayer real-time virtual world, usually text-based. This will get you into an opportunity of actually learning the mechanics behind programming those types of games, uh, but there's a lot to it, so pre be prepared to get your head really, really, really into it, and try to find out what tools that they're actually using for MUDs now, because I'm sure that there's far more advanced programming tools than when I was playing around with it. But no, they're not easy to make at all. Uh, they might have some pre-made clients where you can actually kind of just customize the world and not have to worry about the programming, the hard code. I'd imagine there's like a MUD builder or something that'll let you do that. Uh, but if you're looking into game development, I usually recommend that you start getting yourself in heavily into just basic programming concepts. You've got to learn object-oriented programming. You've got to learn a language. You've got to commit to a language. Uh, I think a Big language now for MMOs. God, they change so quickly. I don't want to say Java. Java are for maybe computer. Um, C++ is still huge in the gaming world. Uh, C Sharp, a lot of the object-based ones. C Sharp, uh, Ruby on Rails is more of a web development. Man, I haven't looked up into programming in quite some time. I'm going to have to get back to you on that. That's a good question. Um... A very good question. Uh, let me see what we got here. It looks like I got an update here. Uh, but it's very, it's very difficult to make your own MMO. Okay, MMOs are are not your average game. Start with like Tetris or chess. <laughs> if you really want to learn to program games, you really should start small and and really expose yourself to the basic core concepts of programming before you try to jump in and make a game because there's a lot of framework you need to build in order to get there. Don't hesitate to buy books online, Amazon, look up some game programming books and and they'll my betters will inform you better of of what to go for from there. Um, Jack says, in my opinion, no, you need some skills with game programming to make a game, but that's just me. I mean, that's kind of, I guess, what I'm getting at, is, is game develop, games are the, actually, the most sophisticated type of programming that you can do. Uh, they're very intensive on graphics, they're very hard on computer systems, they're very, very resource intensive, and they encompass a, such a large array of, of career types. And you got graphics designers, you got editors, you got writers, you got video now you got cinematographers, you got 3D, you got 2D, you got graphics engines, you got... I mean, just look at the end credits of a video game now. I think I beat Diablo 3 and it took like 25, 30 minutes for it to finish the credits. That's how many people are involved in these now. Very massive projects. They push the envelope continually. So game development is very sophisticated uh, career choice. Something to consider if you decide to go into it. It's very analytical, it's very technical, and it requires a lot of patience and a lot of attention. You need to be able to focus. So that's a big thing with game development. Um, P. 
Pcom Fun Fan 97 asks, help me choose which app is better, Spotify or RDO? And have you ever used them? I've had better experience with Spotify. I've never actually used RDIO. You're like the... Uh, I actually use Pandora. So uh, you might not even like me. <laughs> Spotify has far more integration into external services. I know that they make even receivers now, like the Onkyo receivers actually have integrated Spotify. Uh, but Pandora does too. Pandora... I love Pandora because it allows me to add variations to my channels and over time I can train it to really be exactly what I want depending on the mood I'm in. Uh, that's why I love Pandora. Uh, RDIO, I haven't worked with it. It looks extremely popular. It's got a page rank of seven, so obviously it's been around for a long time. Looks kind of like a variation. Let's see what they do. Uh, Tastemaster, influential critics and artists themselves, most popular albums in your network, explore curated playlists. It looks like they all kind of do the same thing. I mean, any kind of service like this, it's really going to be so personalized, it's hard for me to say. Uh, you just got to get your head in them. I've had better experience with Pandora than Spotify. I know a lot of people who would, would just die if I said Pandora was better than Spotify. Uh, I know people who absolutely love Spotify. It gives them a whole new experience in listening to music. Uh, so here we are, you know, we're kind of like up in the air. Uh, either way, aren't these awesome free music services the coolest thing in the world? The fact that you can actually now go to a website and get free music like that and kind of create your own personal experience. Once upon a time, we had to create our own p playlists, you know, and you had to op own all the albums, or if you were, you know, not that up and up, you had to pirate all of your albums, and then you had to generate your own playlist that generated a mood. Now they're like smart playlists. You know, it's based on your preferences and does all this data mining and finds out what other music you might like because you like this one, and it's just amazing what you can do with those now. If you guys haven't, if people listening haven't checked out those kinds of services, they really should. They're all free. I mean, Pandora's free, Spotify is free, and RDIO looks like it's free as well. I mean, they're definitely look working into worth looking into. Okay, what do we got here? Uh, Rev1990, can a 64-bit processor still run 32-bit apps in OS X? Yes, 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 it can. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. It has an emulator built into it for running 32-bit apps. Um, run 32-bit on 64-bit Mac. Uh Learn about 32-bit. I'm, I'm making sure that I can do this. It looks like you have to... Geez, see, I'm not a big Mac guy. You guys are kind of stumping me tonight. I'm going to run a 32-bit app on 64-bit OS X. <laughs> Give me one second. It doesn't... Act, actually, it looks like it's kind of coming down on it. Install 32-bit. Is this a common thing? I mean... There are a lot of 32-bit modes. Yeah, here you go. Run Photoshop in 32-bit mode. And it looks like... It does look like you can actually do a 32-bit or a 64-bit in OS X. According to this Apple, support.apple.com slash KB slash HT3773. Mac OS X, version 10.6 and later include a 64-bit kernel. On hardware support, the 64-bit kernel, you can choose whether to start up or boot your Mac in the 64-bit or the earlier 32-bit. That was OS X version 10.6. How old is this article, though? May 9th, 2012. So that's relatively new. Uh, so, I mean, it looks like it allows you to boot between the two. Wow, really? So they don't actually, because like I know Windows emulates the 32-bit operating system on top of Mac. This kind of tells you how limited of my exposure to Mac is. Uh, wow. That's an excellent question, and that's one I should know the answer to. I'm not going to lie. 60-bit, how do I tell if I'm using 64-bit? Yes. Oh, no. Okay, yeah, maybe you're out of luck. 
If you're running uh, OS 10 Mountain Lion, switching to a 32-bit kernel is not supported. Mountain Lion uses 64-bit mode. OS 10 Lion and earlier versions of OS 10 support a 32-bit. Switching to the 32-bit kernel allows you to use products that use 32-bit kernel extensions. Not good news. Not good news at all. So I'm not thinking you can do that. I am more inclined to... Somebody here correct me, please, if I'm wrong, because, like I said, I'm not extremely proficient in Mac, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it stumbling around. I'll have to get back to you on that, uh, Reb, because that's one that... Make sure you email me, Craig at PCMTechHelp.com, and remind me, because that's something I need to know, personally. And uh, good question. Good question. Why did Dell's business model seemingly fail as a publicly traded company, and how will going private help them turn things around? Dell's business model uh, seemingly, seemingly fails. It, it did fail uh, as a publicly traded company, uh, mostly because their business model stopped being or revolving around actual consumer-based support and quality product. You look at companies like IBM and Apple and Toshiba, and you look at their that hardware service, and they first of all they don't keep all their eggs in one basket. Okay, Dell was exclusively a hardware company, computer hardware company, and the problem is is since they are consumer hardware, consumers tend to buy products on price and less on actual features and, and reliability, whereas the big money and the big real long term investments always going to be in the business world. Now, Dell Business has always been an actual high-quality service, and they've actually done a very good job permeating the business world. But the problem is, is if you're a company that deals exclusively in hardware only and less in added value-added services and implementation of those services, eventually you get obsoleted by the advancement of technology. Technology continues to grow at a faster and faster rate, and it continues to shrink in price at faster and faster rates. So the margin for laptop sales shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, and eventually you're not profitable anymore. So you have to start looking for additional revenue outlets. Companies like Dell do that by selling out their licensing to third-party companies like McAfee and things like that. They're like, okay, with every Dell we sell, we'll package your third-party software. We'll package this, we'll package this, package this, and they have them pay them licensing fees for that. And so now their money is actually coming in as more of a software added gimmick than it is actually a <laughs> a hardware based quality solution or a value added service company and so you can imagine how long that'll take you you know sure it might get you money from time to time but eventually people will catch on that your service isn't superior or your product isn't superior to the competition and they'll start looking for cheaper alternatives well in order to compete Dell's going to have to continue to lower their price and in order to lower the price, you're going to have to start buying cheaper and cheaper parts from China. And this kind of thing continues to happen over time, and eventually your hardware market isn't making you any money anymore. And that's pretty normal. Uh, how going private will turn things around? I don't see how it'll make any difference. company being public or private is, is irrelevant when it comes to things like that. Either you have a succeeding business model or you don't. Uh, the only thing that will make them successful maybe as a private company is they have more exclusivity to the information. They'll have more control because they won't have a board. Maybe they can make quicker decisions, business decisions on changing their infrastructure. Maybe they can branch out more to their business and services. Uh, these are all theoreticals, but uh, <clears throat> in reality, there's just no money in hardware alone. And Dell was a company that never really branched out heavily into the service industry and that's where the money is in tech anymore. The money isn't in hardware anymore. It's unfortunate, but it's true. Next question. I'm going to disable automatic updates. It keeps throwing me off here. Um, looking forward to the show tomorrow night. Me too. Big Nate 84 is going to be a guest on tomorrow's night's show. He is an AV expert. I'm going to call him an expert just to freak him out. He will be interviewed on my show tomorrow at 9 p.m., our normal running time, and we will be talking about recording professional audio, so don't miss that. That's going to be a very fun thing to do. It'll be my first interview. I'm sure it'll be a big mess. I'm sure things will come falling apart right in the middle of it. Audio will stop working. The building will start on fire behind us. It'll be a real good time. At least you'll get it live, 
right? Okay, it looks like Jack Barth corrected me. He goes, Reb, uh, X32 can run on X64 machines, but not vice versa. Now, that is true for Windows. I know that for a fact. And Jack might be correcting me here then in saying that the Mac OS X will support 32 applications if you're running a 64-bit version, which I would hope that would just be shady if they made that not possible. Lunar Soul says, hi, Craig. Hello, Lunar. Welcome to the community. Um, Reb didn't, <laughs> didn't want Jack answering the question, but I still think that Jack at least helped me out on that one, so i got to give him credit. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to skip your question, Reb, just because somebody in the community answers it, so don't worry about that. Uh, and so I actually kind of like when people answer questions that other people ask because I can at least come in here and, and see if it's corroborated, you know, if I'm even on the same page or wavelength. Because sometimes some people will add additional information to what I say. And I'd like to say that out loud. I'd like the people listening to the show to hear it. You know, I'd like them also to see that there are many, many possible solutions to a single problem. And my solution isn't only the always the only or best solution. So I would encourage people to continue to do things like that. I mean, as long as they're being, you know, reasonable, they're not being jerks. So um, Tom Prokes says, Pale Moon is an alternative to Firefox and is faster with the same flexibility. Now, I haven't used Pale Moon, and I'm going to have to have a conversation with you, Tom, because Tom Prokes has suggested Pale Moon, uh, Pico, and what was that other uh, software you suggested earlier? Uh, Clementine, 1.1 Music. But you seem to be really, really into the finding free, cool, fun software packages to work with. Email me, craig at pcmtechhelp.com. I'd like to hear what your top alternatives are, because this is the kind of thing that really is kind of cool to me. It looks like you like to play around with alternative software, and I've never used Pale Moon before. This is actually the third app in this episode that you've suggested that I've never even heard of. So I want to check these out. It looks like you've done some homework, checked them out, and it looks like they're a lot of fun to use. So I'm actually going to, if you send that information to me, I'd like to see it. And maybe in the next episode or two, I can share it with everybody else. Of course, I'll give you credit. So thanks, Tom. That's a good addition. So I can't can't really elaborate on Pale Moon, but, but it is available. P-A-L-E-M-O-O-N um, is an alternative to Firefox. Uh, what do you think about Alienware X51 as a gaming PC? Now, Alienware, if you've got the money, is going to be the top of the line. But if you want to get the most bang for your buck, don't go Alienware. Alienware computers are well-built. They're well-specced. They are they're solid, solid gaming machines. But you're paying for a name. And this is very common. So it's an X51 here. I want to take a look at what you got here. Uh, just in general, a mini HD computer. Ooh. Now, it looks like you can go from $700 to 1274 on this X51 series laptop. And you go from a core i3 dual core all the way up to third generation i7. Okay? If I'm looking at these three, actually their pricing is not that unreasonable on this. Is this a desktop? You could still probably get a better deal at CyberPower PC or Sager. But it looks like they come standard with Windows 7, which I'm a huge supporter of. And your biggest thing you're going to want to do is Google. You have the GT640, NVIDIA GeForce GT640. That's the graphics card on the two lower-end ones. And then you have a GTX 660, which I'm going to guess is substantially better than the GT640. Actually, I'm almost positive that's true. And your graphics card for a gaming PC is your bread and butter, okay? So if you're going to have to choose for this system, you want to Google GTX 660 versus whatever your alternative graphics cards are available. So... If I take this system and I say, yes, Dell price is $1079, and then I go over to CyberPower PC, I'm going to take that dollar amount and I'm going to compare it with a CyberPower PC of the equivalent price range. I'm going to take a look at the graphics card, and I'm going to see, does this graphics card compare in the Google metrics? Lots and lots of websites do comparisons on benchmarks. 
So let's say they're running the GTX 670 as a benchmark on uh, as the graphics card on the CyberPower PC. So I'll go to Google and I'll type in GTX 660 versus GTX 770. I'll press enter. I'll be very, very shocked if there isn't a benchmark, a full-blown benchmark with di diagrams and charts and the nerds are in full force. All right, We're always out there plugging away at ways of coming up with comparison charts and, and gaming comparisons. Then when I've actually looked at those statistics, I want to compare them to games that I'm going to play. Okay, What games am I most likely to play now? And do they run exceptionally well now because I can anticipate in the next two to four years I'm going to buy more games? So if they run at the base 30 frames per second now, then you're kind of pushing it because you want your games to run at 30 frames per second in the future as well, right? So you should at least spec above 30 frames per second on the games you play now at the very least. I'd suggest 45 to 60 at the very least. Ideally, you want a 80 to 120 situation on the current games. That way it kind of prepares you for the future. So, And I don't do specific hardware comparisons on my website. I don't have the time to do it. That is a full-time job. But I do know how to research that type of information. So if you decide, hey, I'm deciding between this laptop and this laptop or this desktop and this desktop, Craig, will you help me out? Go to the community page, pcmtechhelp.com slash community, and post it there. Ask your question, and I'll post in better detail exactly what I think your answer would be. And you might have some other people coin in. Or you can send me an email, craig at pcmtechhelp.com. Tell me the models you're considering, and I'll look at them myself. And that's really probably going to be your best route. And I'm going to ask you what games you're going to play, so make sure you tell me that. So... Out of the box, this actually isn't that unreasonable a price for what you're getting, it looks like. A GTX 660, I don't think that, I think I had a 670 in my laptop, so maybe that is a bit pricey for what you're getting. Let me see what I got on mine, because mine's even kind of old now. GTX 670, yeah, see, I have a GTX 670M, and that's on my mobile. See, and that, see that's not a comparison either, because I have a mobile, and this looks like it's a desktop. So the desktop graphics cards actually run better than the mobile graphics cards. So even that's not a fair comparison. So I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I'd have to do more research. So let me know what you're going to do. Join the community, and we will get you all straightened out. We'll get you taken care of. That's for sure. Let's go up here. Angry American One says, what's up? What's up? Philly Computer Spot says, why no ads? I believe YouTube Lives can have ads. No, not quite yet. Um, they don't have a way of actually implementing a while broadcasting live ad sequence just yet on uh, on Google Plus Hangouts. I believe it's coming. I don't know if that has something to do with their maybe their process of approving ads uh, because a lot of times they don't like to pre-approve a video before it's done. So they might be worried about live copyright infringement. You know what I mean? So traditionally with YouTube, when you're going to advertise on your video, the video has to be completed, and then you have to submit it for monetization, and then they actually review it. And after you've gained trust over a long period of time, they approve it almost immediately. But when you're initially doing it, they actually take some time to make sure that you're not stealing content or violating copyright while you're broadcasting. So... I don't know why they haven't fully implemented it yet, but this Google Hangouts is still kind of a brand new thing. Live broadcast is kind of a brand new thing as of like six months ago, almost a year ago, I think. They talked about it, but now it's actually kind of stabilized, so they're getting there. Um, Jack Barth says, Craig, I use Windows Explorer to simply organize my media and folders and use VLC to play them. I don't organize within the application. See, now you're the kind of guy who would prefer your own set of organizational files. What he's saying is, is he just uses the files and folders in Windows, sorts all of his music out, and then when he actually goes to play music, he just opens it up in that folder, right-clicks play all in that particular folder. A lot of people probably wouldn't be, pit, uh, uh, fans of doing it that way for music organization and playback, but that is probably the most efficient way to manage your media as far as performance is concerned. VLC is incredibly fast, so that's not a bad way to do it, Jack. So I, I can see why you would do it. What's WinRAW? Then Retarded Horses asks. 
I know what WinRAR is. Okay, maybe that's what you meant to ask. WinRAR is a file extraction utility. It is available on my website. You know how when you get a web, uh, an email in your, wow, an email with a file in it and the file is compressed, okay, which means that there's a bunch of files packaged into a single file. WinRAR is one of the software applications that allows you to extract those files onto your desktop or into a different location so that you can actually run them. File compression is the act of stripping out unneeded characters so that it can temporarily shrink the file size and then re-adding those characters when the file is decompressed. It's so you can shrink the file size before you send it out. And it also allows you the convenience of storing multiple files into a single file. So that's essentially the philosophy behind these file compression utilities. And you have WinZip, you have WinRAR, you have 7-Zip. There's a number of file extraction utilities you can get that will allow you to decompress these files. .rar files, .zip files, .cab files, .iso files. These are all types of compression and, and cabinet files that are designed to be decompressed by specialized software before you can use them. Or in the case of ISO, mounted. So I hope that's what you were asking about because you kind of said win, win raw. Uh, Angry American One says, here's my question, and then puts a question mark. What's the difference between Windows 8 and Windows 8? One of them is Windows 8. <laughs> Angry American One asks, do you know how to bond three DSL connections? I have three and want to bond them together for faster speeds. Please help. Bond them together to boost your speed? You really can't do that. If you have three separate DSL connections, which means you're paying for three separate DSL services, you're trying to accumulate bandwidth across three separate assigned IP addresses. Really, it can't be done except for at the source. If you want to increase network bandwidth, the only way to really do it is to go through your ISP and pay for additional bandwidth. There's no, there's no way of actually combining all three together to all of a sudden get a super connection. Um, what you could do is you could have one dedicated to your like living room computer, you could have one dedicated to your basement computer, and you could have one dedicated to your home computer, your laptop, and then you've distributed the bandwidth across three separate devices in your home. That way when one device is using it, it's not sucking down the bandwidth of another device. But that's probably as good as you can get when you're talking about getting the most out of your bandwidth that you already have available to you. Just connecting them together isn't there as far as I can as far as I know, there's no way to actually just actually I don't even in my head I don't even know how the technology could do that create a situation like that. So I hope that's an adequate question to your problem. Um, Reb1990X asks, what's the difference between Windows 8 and Windows 8 Pro? Well, if we go to Windows 8 comparison versions, we can look right at it. At the top they have what Windows is right? Which Windows is right for you from Microsoft Windows? We have a nice little grid here that will actually for this particular case I will share my screen with you guys because it seems appropriate we have a nice shared little Windows release feature comparison now you have Windows RT which is like a release uh, tablets and PCs uh, and then we got Windows 8 and then we got Windows 8 Pro okay Windows 8 has the built-in apps mail calendar yeah 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 as in Explorer 10 which is not really a feature but whatever keeps you up to date with secure Windows Defender Windows Update runs programs you used to use with previous versions of Windows and then you get into the issue of Windows 8 Pro no longer supports enhanced data protection using BitLocker technology to keep your information secure which looks like an encryption software package don't know how much you would want to use that because you can get your own encryption software as third party uh, it doesn't come with Office and Home Office. Uh, it enables you to connect your piece to your PC when you're on the go with remote desktop. Not really much of a feature because you could look at my website and download two free ones. TeamViewer is a free software package that will allow you to remote desktop not only from another computer, but 
from a tablet or smartphone. TeamViewer. You can also do the same thing with Log Me In. And guess what? Both are free. All you have to do is go to Networking and Admin is the section. If PCMTechHelp.com slash downloads, Networking and Admin will actually tell you where the remote desktop, uh, you can go TeamViewer or log me in for that. Uh, connect to your corporate or school network with a domain. This is important if you are actually in a business environment. So really this tells me if you have a domain, you have to have Windows 8 Pro. If you don't have a domain and you don't need to connect to your domain or you don't know what a domain is, you're not using it for business purposes, then you do not need Windows 8 Professional. That would be my biggest thing. Because the other features that they're claiming are features aren't really features. So we're going to be actually getting into the question roundup here. I call the end of my segment the question roundup because we're actually already at 10 p.m. And I know I kind of had a little five-minute segue there. I apologize for that. Uh, I think today was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun with this again. Hopefully my audio levels are better. I had to retweak my microphone. Does anybody else have an issue with the volume levels going high and low and high and low on this video? Something's going on with this live broadcast that causes it to do that. But in the question roundup segment, essentially, I have to start shooting through the rest of the questions, and hopefully, if one of them really catches my eye, we are going to actually start off our next segment with that particular question tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern, so make sure you guys tune in for that. So let's go ahead and get started on the roundup. Wild Linus says, they don't call it massive for nothing. Okay, good, not a question. I don't have to answer that one, but good comment. Lunar Soul says, hey, Craig, I've been having internet issues. I'm not tech illiterate, but I can't find the cause in this case. When my phone rings, my internet either lags or disconnects. Any idea why? Sounds to me like you have noise on your line. You need to have your technician from your DSL service, because I'm guessing you're running DSL, come out and test your line while the phone is ringing. They are not supposed to be interfering. It could also be due to a filter. Now, if you do not have a filter on a DSL line, um, usually you have to have a filter attached to your phone coming out of your phone jack. So if they haven't provided you with those filters or you just haven't hooked them up, usually they give them to you when they come out for the first time, you have to connect a filter to your phone jack and then plug your phone into the filter. This keeps phone data from going back onto the line, which can affect your bandwidth and your signal strength. Probably one of those two is the cause. Um, LOL while Linus uh, from Jack Barth must have been funny. What's the best gamepad game controller? I love the Windows XP controller, and you can get a USB to wireless adapter for an. I'm sorry, I love the Xbox 360 controller. Is that what I said? You can get an adapter for your uh, Windows computer to run a, uh, win <laughs> a Microsoft Windows XP 360 controller on your Windows operating system. Google it, it's awesome. Apple versus Android, whoa. I might start the next segment out with that one because that is a huge question. So let's go ahead and go down here. Uh, next question, next question. Pecom fan fun 97 I'm sorry, I couldn't answer that one, that's huge. The Angry American one, Craig buddy, I got professional audio, which I use in my live show. Cool, that's awesome. <laughs> Pavilion 130 says, I did a scan for empty folders on Glary today and I found quite a few. Can I safely delete all of these? Yes, Glary does a very good job of not removing stuff that is critical, but always back up your registry through the registry cleaner before doing any kind of cleaning utilities. If you want to know how to do that, just click on the start menu button, type in regedit, R-E-G-E-D-I-T, press enter, Press yes to the prompts, click the file menu, click export, and export it onto an external device like a USB drive or a CD. Got to do it. Got to do it. Reb 1990X, off topic. Is it true when you use the app Shazam, the Shazam, the sound of the toilet flush, it will come with a Jester Bieber album? I'm trying that after this is over. That is awesome. Apparently, if you use Shazam... <laughs> The app Shazam, which is designed to listen to a music track you're, you're listening to to identify it. Rev1990 says, if you use Shazam at the sound of a toilet flush, it'll come up with a Justin Bieber album. We're going to have to test that theory. I want to see somebody at the community test that one for me. I want to see proof. I want them to record it. I want them to put it on there as proof. Because that sounds hilarious. I want to see it. What do I think of the Windows uh, new Windows 8 phone? I think it's... Two years too late. 
I think it's a great product, and it would have been an even greater product had they released it at a time where it could compete in the current market. There's not enough apps in the App Store available, and I think it really appeals to people who are looking into the Xbox Live features and any kind of online gaming features. Very cool. Null Set Computer Company says, Awesome, Nate. I'll be sure to catch the interview tomorrow. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about it, too. Welcome to the show, Null Set. I've followed you quite a bit. While Linus says, You said you're a gamer, Craig. What do you play on the norm? Right now, I am heavily into Diablo 3. And uh, if you want to know my gamer tag, jump into the community page and ask, ask me. Uh, PCMTechHelp.com slash community, for those of you just joining me. Um, <clears throat> Diablo 3 I'm heavy on. I played SW Tour for a while. I stopped doing that. Probably going to start up Mass Effect 3. I've been reluctant to because of what everybody said about it. Uh, but mostly action RPGs. I'm heavy into action RPGs. And uh, not big on shooters. Never been big on the first-person shooters, except for Goldeneye, which was like, was, it was my Black Ops, you know, because everybody's got their Black Ops. Mine was Goldeneye. My age is showing. That's for Nintendo 64. Jack Berth says, Craig, as I said yesterday, I recently, recently purchased a Nexus 7, my first tablet computer. Do you have any thoughts on this device? Would you recommend it? I definitely recommend the Nexus 7. In fact, it's at the top of my recommendation list for anybody considering a smaller tablet that's very, very cost-effective. The Nexus series, I cannot believe how good of a job they did on these Nexus tablets. Tablets are so user-friendly, they're so intuitive, they're so fast, they're so cost-effective. You can really tell why Android is starting to give Apple a run for their money. I'm not saying I don't like the iPad. I've got an iPad. I love my iPad. But it is a very good product. Definitely worth checking out. What's better, a Xeon server CPU or a Core i7 type CPU? Depends on your operating system, null set. Sometimes your operating system will not even support the Xeon. Uh, I would say if you're running a server and you're using a lot of software applications that require multi-core support, you're probably better off with the Xeon. But for desktop applications, you're gonna be wanting you're gonna be wanting <laughs> you're gonna be wanting to adopt the Core i7 in most cases. Pcom Fun Fan 97 says, I became a YouTube partner a few months ago, but I don't know what kind of videos I should upload. Look at my channel and tell me, please. Uh, come back tomorrow, and I will. Uh, you're going to have to post this question earlier in the show. I will be more than happy to look over your channel, and I'll give you all kinds of suggestions. So I can't do that right now. I'm actually six minutes over as it is, but I'd be more than happy to do it. Uh, Rev 1990X, I mean Windows 8, Windows 8 Pro, yeah, I got that eventually. Philly Computer Spot says, there's a window program I use for Windows 98. The company who made the program is out of business. Is it possible to get the code of the program so that I can rewrite it myself to work with the new OS? This is very common in the industrial world, which I work. And um, you can only get the code if you can find the original developers. You have to find the people who coded the program. It's the only way you're going to get it. You can try to use reverse engineering programs, but you're going to reverse it. Reverse engineer it typically in hexadecimal and it's going to be thousands upon thousands of pages of code, and it's going to be undocumented. Nearly impossible to actually reassemble and reprogram. You're better off starting from scratch. So uh, that's the short and pithy answer to it. Uh, Lunar Silver, your audio seems fine to me. I'm glad. At the start, but not, but now anymore, audio. Okay. Uh, that was the wild Linus. So to make a cheap and easy MMORPG, I hire people. Well, there's a lot of programmers looking for work, but I wouldn't call them cheap or easy. <laughs> CJ Geiner, is it? I think it was. You have a good night, Craig, and see you tomorrow night. Geiner is French. Welcome to the show. Everyone's welcome. Wild Linus says, thank you much time for your Craig. Good night. Time to put my kid, kids to sleep. Good night. Thank you, Wild Linus. Hope to catch you on the community. The shit. Aww. Pcom Fun Fan says the Shazam toilet thing doesn't work. But it was a fun thing to think that worked, you know, for a little while. Tom Polk says, good night, I'll email you. I appreciate it, Tom. Now that's all we have for tonight. We went eight minutes over, but that's cool because I disappeared for four in the middle of it. And I appreciate all you guys stopping by. Remember, the PCM Tech Help Show is all about the subscribers. PCM Tech Talk Live is a segment dedicated just to you guys. And the whole reason I do this is because I am a nerd and I love to talk about it. Now, I am syndicated on iTunes as a podcast, so if you want to subscribe to my podcast, just jump right onto iTunes, look up PCM Tech Help Show. I will show up 
so exciting what Giddy is a schoolgirl about that. You can also subscribe to me on YouTube. That helps me out a lot. And if you're still here, make sure you like this video because that helps me out a lot as well. I always like when you guys stop by and ask questions. I appreciate it. And I'll appreciate it even more if you're at the community participating in the geekery that goes on there. I think I might call you guys the PCM techies, but I also like the PC minions because I, li I like to watch a lot of Despicable Me. So maybe you guys will help me decide on that. Again, I'm on all the major social networks, Facebook, Twitter. If you go to my YouTube channel, pcmtechhelp.com slash YouTube, you can see all of my major social networks on the right-hand sidebar, or you can just go to pcmtechhelp.com and see all of the junk there. So as always, thanks for stopping by, and I appreciate your time, and I will see you guys tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Maybe sharp. Depends on if my kid needs me. <laughs> Have a good one.